Alright everyone, welcome back to Warptorio. We ended last episode with switching on our new nuclear reactor, which means the struggle for power will be over, at least for a while. Not only have we increased our maximum power draw by a whole order of magnitude, but the best thing about nuclear power is that it doesn't consume a Mount Everest of coal per hour. That's right, no more hand hauling heaps of coal over to feed the hungry boilers of the steam power plant. Let it be gone. But thanks to our tenfold increased power ceiling, there's a second massive coal consumer which we can get rid of. While the steel furnaces have done a great job providing the base with resources from the very beginning of this playthrough, the time will soon come to switch over to electric smelting. And of course we've got a shiny new blueprint for that. It fits in smelting on the boiler floor, together with a weird ring of the slowest moving oil storage the world has ever seen. As well as space for a second nuclear reactor in the bottom square. And we're gonna need that one sooner than you think. Thanks to our extended loot chest hunting trying to find a whole nuclear power plant in loot chests, the base has meanwhile produced a nice supply of stored goods, including all the necessary red chips we need to make 100 electric furnaces. Wait a minute, 100 electric furnaces? Indeed, that's twice the amount of steel furnace that we are running. Which means we can finally upgrade from the single yellow belts of iron and copper we've been producing all game long to the double capacity, double speed, full red belts of plates. But that means we're also gonna need some bigger mining platforms. But man, actually building that whole blueprint seems like a lot of work. So let's take a nice little break from this Warptorio madness and go make ourselves a nice little power armor with a set of personal roboports so we can supervise construction from a nice and cozy chair while our personal construction sleigh bots do all the hard labor. That means we're gonna need to make some complicated assembly products like electric engines and blue chips. It would take way too long to fully automate them at this point, so let's just hand feed our way to the power armor with a bunch of temporary setups, like this temporary temporary electric engine assembly area. Thanks to our decision to barrel lubricant, we just need to sprinkle 15 barrels of lubricant on top of 50 engines to get 50 electric engines. And if you are thinking, like editing Mike at this point, man, this guy and all his hand feeding. Well, at least the blueprint he is using is a definitive build without any temporary screw ups. Let me introduce you to my blueprinted temporary blue chip assembler. It was put in place especially to help you hand feed your way to an early power armor. So that's what we're gonna use it for. 200 blue chips should do the job. Alright, while we wait for all of that to complete crafting, let's address the warp elephant in the room. Now we have nuclear power, we can finally stop tiptoeing around with efficiency modules in our warp beacon. Let's stomp some productivity modules in there instead. And immediately this floor is consuming more power than our old steam engine setup could supply. Nice. But we are not gonna stop there. Let's slap productivity modules in all of our important assemblers, like blue science, red chips and so on. These productivity bonuses stack with those of the warp beacon, which makes it so that each of these prod modded assemblers now have a whopping 20% productivity bonus, something you would normally only be able to achieve with the hyper expensive Mark III productivity modules. Yeah, did I ever mention the warp beacon is the most powerful feature in all of Warptorio by far? And we haven't even got started unlocking its potential yet. Oh man. But another thing to say oh man about is that the fighters are finding new ways to wage war against our poor Factorio engineer. We have been on this planet for over 4 hours now, and the exponentially intensifying pollution cloud 
is now rapidly expanding into previously unexisting parts of the planet. And the intense smoke cloud is triggering literal tens of thousands of behemoth biters to start parting towards our base from the most remote regions of this planet. And their parting calculations are not that simple, as they need to traverse around giant bodies of water and even through the narrow gaps between trees in thick forests. The worst part is, they are sending all of their parting calculations as a DDoS attack on my hardware, slowly warping the game to make it unable to run at normal speed. We are already down to 40 UPS and it's gonna get worse quickly, until we're able to warp off of this planet, which does not appear to be anytime soon. This biter parting UPS issue is why I set the homeworld to be treeless, cliffless, lakeless and finite in the form of a giant continent. All of this should make biter parting a lot easier on the system. And the finite continent gives us an opportunity to eventually get rid of biter parting calculations entirely. Anyway, we couldn't influence the map settings for this world, Warp Zone 8, so we will just have to deal with it I suppose. At least I can speed up the footage for the video accordingly, so it runs roughly at 60 UPS. Anyway, while editing Mike was complaining about the biters ruining his UPS, playing Mike has finished up his power armor. He made more electric engines, then switched on the top 4 plastic assemblers. so that he could make a few handfuls of low density structures. Which were required to make these 30 Mark 1 batteries into 3 Mark 2 batteries. 15 portable solar panels will have to supply our inventory grid with power until a better option comes along. And with that we are able to craft the power armor. Which grants us another 10 inventory slots. Nice. We still need to fill the inventory grid, but while we wait for the required blue chips and low density structures, let's make 3 Mark II productivity modules and slap them in the warp beacon. We also finish up prod modding our entire base, and this is where the plan comes together. Every machine under the warp beacon now has a 26% productivity bonus, and the increased range of the warp beacon now precisely covers all laps on the right, blue signs on the left, and red chips in the south. Speaking of red chips, thanks to the new 26% productivity bonus, each copper wire assembler can now support almost 8 red chip assemblers. That by itself doesn't sound like a giant increase, but remember, the productivity bonus is applied during each individual step from copper plate, to copper wire, to green chip, to red chip. And the compound interest over 3 steps already stacks up to making nearly twice as much red chips out of a copper plate than without productivity. Crazy huh? And while for now, in the blue science era, 26% productivity on each step is the maximum attainable, what if I told you that in the end game we can obtain a maximum of 140% productivity bonus on each single step? Why yes, funny you should ask, that does break the game in many ways. But even played fairly, that means we will be able to fit a proper mega base inside of the war platform. How many signs per minute do you think is possible to fit just on the war factory floor? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, while narrating Mike went off on a tangent again, playing Mike has meanwhile completed his power armor with up to 15 portable solar panels powering up to 3 exoskeletons and 3 roboports. Nice. With the new power plant and personal bots on the way, we are finally ready to work on the new electric smelting setup. 
It sure is nice we pre-made this handy dandy blueprint so we can take a quick peek at the exact components required to build it. This is the first time we are going to be using a lot of red belts and underground. So we use our two chests of stashed up iron gears as an excuse to keep handcrafting away. Playing Mike then finally spots that long-handed inserter he misplaced 1.21 gigaseconds ago. But unfortunately we cannot travel through time to fix our fun cups. We'll just leave it as is, as a relic of the past. No, I wouldn't do that to you, would I? You've suffered long enough. The productivity bonus is kicking in noticeably, and with so many red chips available, we start a second batch of 100 electric furnaces for future steel smelting. But before we build any smelting at all, we first rebuild the expanded mining platforms. The pollution cloud of that has almost reached the miners, but we can't move it out of the way just yet. We still need this access point to support the external uranium mine. The new mining platform blueprint supports 36 miners instead of just 16 and can generate one and a quarter red belt of ore. But if we also research the five blue warp mining productivity bonuses, it'll be worth a whopping 1.6 red belt of ore, which is over three times our current iron intake. But to actually build it, we need a lot more gun turrets and even a lot, lot more ammo. We choose to first rebuild the copper miner, because, well, the iron sight size upgrade hasn't finished researching just yet. We take all the ammo out of the turrets before we remember biters exist. So we quickly plop down 4 gun turrets just to ease our mind, because 4 turrets are just a puny drop against the behemoths we're dealing with. Anyway, it won't take too long to take down and rebuild the platform, as for the very first time this playthrough we deploy our personal construction bots. And promptly despawn the end of our steel furnace setup. Well, it's not like we're going to need those anymore anyway. With Behemoth Biters now taking tens of magazines to kill a single one, we opt to leave 50 magazines per gun turret instead of 25. With the added extra belt and the upgrade to red belts, this mining platform has quadrupled its maximum throughput since our old initial installment. Nice! Back on the factory floor, Stone Bricks now has its own electric smelting setup, together with some more cursed belt weaving. 
it'll probably be a while though before we actually have belt space to spare for automated stone. After expanding the size of the mining platforms, let's also invest into expanding the size of these factory floors. Then we also rebuild the expanded iron mining platform, though this time we make sure to reclaim our stuff from the area that will despawn. You may notice that with each mining platform size upgrade, the hallways inside become two tiles wider as well, while the harvester floor size oval office grows with each floor size upgrade instead. And I frame perfectly miss the moment supreme the floor expands. But through the magic of video editing to hide the evidence, we can still see it happen as if I didn't. Our puny steel setup is a major bottleneck at the moment, so we quickly make it 50% less puny, even though we will be rebuilding this entire floor soon. But with full red belts of ore now sorted, the higher priority floor build is the smelting setup in the boiler basement. Unsurprisingly I guess, our solar powered personal armor isn't recharging much underground. So instead of using our personal roboports to do the construction, we built two actual roboports, which can charge the bots straight off the nuclear reactor. We simply fill a storage chest with all of the elements needed to build the blueprint, sit back and enjoy the show. Now that we've successfully shoved smelting into the boiler basement, it is time to start clearing out the entire harvester floor's old infrastructure, starting by pumping out our old oil over to the basement as well.
Natural flow between storage tanks is fairly slow. Natural flow between storage tanks is fairly slow, but we can force instant transfer of fluids by simply deconstructing the tanks in order. As long as there is enough empty space in an adjacent tank, zero fluid is lost, which in practice means if both tanks are under hull full, we can deconstruct the next one. Productivity modules are great to make the most out of every last ore in a resource-starved base, but they also introduce a crafting speed penalty. Since we doubled our production to red belts now, we sacrifice one productivity module in the war beacon for a speed module to negate that penalty, and allow our factory to produce and consume over one and a half times faster for only a tiny loss in productivity bonus. We also need to get rid of this iron ore, since we are trying to empty out the entire harvester floor. And to ensure oil production isn't interrupted during the harvester floor rebuild, we put some temporary oil storage tanks outside. Lastly, we prepare a big temporary steel boost to keep blue signs going. And finally transport all the temporary chests out of the way. And not before long, we are ready to also rebuild the harvester floor up to the new standard. Alright, so before the bots build anything, we'll first reinstate the critical oil pipeline. There's a Warptorio tech called Triloader, which adds a third war belt in between and pushes the war pipe out another tile, so the oil pipes connect one tile further out than you'd expect. And indeed, these two reservoirs are already full, but to get it flowing into the base, we now need to connect oil to the top pipeline. Then it's time to build this side-loading belt monstrosity. It has more pieces than an IKEA cabinet, but fortunately, that's not my problem anymore. The copper miner can alternatively be deployed as a coal mining platform. The coal will flow north into the buffer chests and once Triloader has been researched, we can finally have fully automated coal flowing onto the factory floor. And that is copper ore smelting and copper and iron plate distribution already reconnected. And yes, we'll get to this clever, cool, clean, compact steel smelting setup soon. But first the iron ore needs to be reconnected as well.
We've also got a bigger and better plate overflow buffer, which works the same as before. Priority output to the factory floor from the smelters. Although this time it is likely we'll get some actual use out of the plate overflow storage instead of all my iron being consumed all the time. Alright, on to that compact steel smeltery. The iron ore flows in on the red belt, where it is picked off by the yellow inserters to smelt iron. The smelted iron plate is then transferred to the southern smelting site, where it is further smelted into steel. Finally, the last yellow inserter outputs the steel on the yellow belt. Neat, huh? Note that the super compact setup is only possible for steel, as due to the extra smelting cycle we can ping pong the finished steel plate out on the other belt than the iron ore came in. We don't even need any of that cursed belt weaving, just normal undergrounds will do. Note that there is no way to weave an additional iron belt through the steel smeltery, so it's sublime that we have an extra smudge of space south of the steel smeltery to sneak by an iron ore belt to be smelted into iron plates in the boiler basement. Nice. And that's the new smeltery completed. It's looking a lot less crowded in here than before, but it's all we need for a long while. When we'll need more capacity, these floors and hallways will have expanded again multiple times over, so there's no need to further optimize now. And eventually, I will move all of the smelting, no, not down to the boiler basement, up to the factory floor. Down here, one steel costs 5 iron ore to make, but in the end game under the fully upgraded war beacon, we will be able to smelt one steel from one iron ore. Yeah, it's that powerful. So perhaps you want to adjust your science per minute prediction up or down, as you may have underestimated the full power of the war beacon, or you may have not expected that I will have to fit in all of the machinery including smelting exclusively under the war beacon on the factory floor above. And no matter if you're a belt guy or a bot gal or a train trans, the endgame base is gonna be so all inclusive it could win the Eurovision Song Festival without even singing a song. Anyway, before we get there we still have a big hurdle to overcome. How the heck are we gonna deal with the UPS issue? It has been steadily declining, and it has gotten as low as 30 UPS this episode already, and we're gonna be stuck on this warp zone for several more hours, which will then be extended to another several more hours by the UPS issue. Its effects are even leaking through into the real world, as the audio signal has been getting worse and worse since we arrived on this planet, and the time dilation has clearly affected my upload schedule. Will we be able to launch off of this planet before its black hole gravity well becomes too strong and we disappear behind the biter UPS event horizon forever? Find out next time.